much for coming. Of course. It's so nice to have you. Thank you. It's nice been, to be here. Yeah, it's been a long, uh, it's been a long journey, and we finally got you in. I know that the crew was very excited about having you today uh-huh. too. So, um, I'm just going to run through a couple of questions. There's a lot going on with your career right now. I know that we were just talking about you moving to Wyoming mm-hmm. and how beautiful that is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did say to you how strategic that is because you make everybody come to you now. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, it's so great. I love that. <laughs> I also said, I say that too, because I don't want to be driving around LA all day coming to people's houses unless it's a must. But um, this year, uh, just right out the gate, you were part of Forbes 30 Under 30, which I actually didn't know. There's a lot I don't know. My researchers are amazing because (laughs) I don't know half the crap about my clients. I just love them. They come in fresh. Um, So I get to be part of this journey with all of you guys and find out a little bit more about your lives through this process. So it's such a amazing achievement not knowing that and doing some research on that what how did you react to that kind of recognition because I know you're a very private <laughs> person the, what what I know of you right yeah. you like your space and so what was that like for you that was really that's something that really struck me I don't know just because I, I had no idea it was coming and when I found out it was kind of like that's just such a high kind of a claim um so it put things into perspective just to be included in like a in a group of people like that yeah so how do you come how do you it's almost that career thing of how do you top that what are you what what are you gonna do next you know what I mean so it it was really cool to read that and um you know you've been around the world with my friends the lovely chain smokers we love those boys um but you started on your own adventure now as an artist can you tell the listeners about uh the new LP quiet mind quiet Quite your mind? Of course. I I started as an artist um, and then kind of ventured into songwriting when my band split apart when I got to college, um, which was something I was super resistant to because it was, for me, writing was always sitting down at the piano and getting out my emotions and kind mm-hmm. of just having an outlet. Um, and I got in the rooms with a bunch of amazing people and slowly was like, wait, this is a completely different craft that's amazing in its own way and I and I learned kind of in those three years or three or four years where I was just focusing on that how much how how to write a song so much better than I knew before um and then when it came to I had I had a big collection of songs that and sorry (laughs) I had a a few songs in the in the many songs I'd written that I wasn't really comfortable giving away to other people and when there was three of those songs basically I was like all right obviously I have something that I want to say yeah and I can't keep like suppressing that that's so uh, you know it's so interesting to me because I was talking to one of my producers earlier about this um giving music away Mm -hmm. I I don't know I have a lot of artists that do that right they Mm -hmm. write songs for other people one of my artists wrote a big hit and he ended up giving it to Maroon 5 and I'm like how could you do it's such a great song and he's because he's he's gonna make me like a ton of money (laughs) so you know I and I got it and so then that parlayed him into the next section of his career but I've always wondered about that when you give away songs what is that like I mean because they're your babies and I, I would feel as an artist that that would be really hard to give that away or is it just sort of you separate the art from the business side of it right yeah I think that's that's kind of exactly (laughs) it I think I'm really lucky to say that there's pretty much no songs that I've given away that I regret giving away just because to me it's such a separate craft kind of when I'm in the room with an artist I'm telling their story and helping them get out what they want to say and then when I sit down to write for myself it's like it's fully me so that the two kind of songs are different kinds of songs so you separate those out so yeah. you know when you're going into the room to write for someone else you right. know that you're on a job so it's not like you're writing a song and you've got this magical thing and then you decided to sell it to somebody else right exactly okay I, especially now I mean the reason those few songs came up was I had written them for pitch and someone would want to cut them and I'd be like uh, I don't this is my story I don't want someone else I don't know if I'm comfortable with someone else singing it and that's when I decided, okay, now I'm going to sit down and write for myself when it's for my own stuff and yeah, that just keep just, it separate. It seems like you'd have to keep it separate yeah. because so many people do that. Um, and I just, you know, one of my other artists who, this was a song, it was huge and sold it to Rihanna and I'm like, 
every time I hear the other person sing this song yeah. in her shows, I'm thinking this really is your song. She's right. like, well, but it's not, right. you know, she still sings it or would sing it on tour. Fans know her to have written this song, but when we hear it, we think about Rihanna. And so right. it's just kind of, I've always really wondered about that with songwriters. Like, how do you give that away? So it's interesting to hear, uh, hear a different perspective. Yeah. Um, so where are you currently based out of? And, and where, I know we talked chapped a little bit into this. You write your songs all over the world. I know that I've Skyped with you before in a couple of different countries where you're just with friends chilling and writing. But where, and you've recently obviously moved to Wyoming, but we're, so you call that your main hub now or have, has it been just a myriad of places? Yeah, Wyoming's, it's the first time I've had a place in five years. <laughs> I've been like staying with friends here or like my family's in New York, so I was staying with them and then... Like the riding nomad. Exactly. I was yeah. fully out of a suitcase for five years um, and then got tired of that. Yeah. But it's really cool kind of on the writing side. There's obviously people write songs everywhere in the world. And in and, and the past kind of two or three years, writing camps have really cropped up in mm -hmm. really interesting locations. And people will rent out a studio. And I've done one in Nicaragua or I was just in one in this like giant Downton Abbey type house in the countryside in England um, and you kind of just get sometimes it's for a specific artist and the label puts it together and then sometimes it's just like in the case of this one I was just in in England it's writers and producers and everyone's just kind of writing songs and being creative and eating dinners together so you pick spots as writers to become inspired yeah okay so it there's a there's a there's a you know method to the madness yeah yeah because I know some of the places you've been in are kind of crazy and I know for a lot of my other artists that are writers, songwriters as well, that seems to be their thing. Like if they yeah. can get out and write somewhere else where it's going to be inspiring, inspire others. Right. Because you, you sort of have to bring that, that art form together and be in a comfortable space. So right. um, what is your schedule like? What is, it's always different. Because I know you're, you're doing a lot of different things now. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always different. I mean, I think especially now that I've kind of, since I put the album out and was doing a couple of shows for that, it's kind of, it's a week by week kind of assessment um I'm writing is still kind of what I'm doing regularly um and that's five or six days a week and then like we just did a couple one-off shows for the album so that was like focusing on that for a few weeks but what do you do with just just jumping off of that this is probably a later question but you have brought it up now so I want to address it because I'm curious what you do with writer's block and is there any such thing as a writer's block and do you experience that and when you do what do you do with that yeah definitely I mean I think collaborating and why I fell in love with collaborating is because it's it's way harder to get yourself stuck when there's other people in the room just because I mean I, I the way I always like to write is from the truth and so whenever I get in the room with someone it's like three four sometimes five hours of just talking like just what's going on with you where and if I've never met them like where are you from what's your whole that sounds story? exhausting <laughs> yeah. it's, but I it's, mean for me it's probably I'm a little older than you Bo I'm like that's just I just want to take a nap wasn't it? <laughs> it's actually like that's it's probably why I don't write <laughs> but yeah. that's like that's why that's why I couldn't I used to do sessions seven days a week and sometimes multiple sessions in a day and then it was like it's it's just a lot like it's draining at the it's end of the day draining, yeah right? I can't talk to anyone anymore I have to just like you have to go into your shell and kind yeah. of be quiet so you understand why artists kind of are the way that they are yeah you know you have to have that energy and that downtime because if people are taking all your energy all the time you have to reboot Right. You know, I know in my job, I have to reboot. I deal with different types of singers, different types of ages, different personalities all day long, every day, sometimes six days a week, yeah. um, depending on the touring and their schedule. And I just have to go shut myself in right. my room and I don't want to really talk to anybody. And that's harder to do when you've got kids. Of I have course. kids, but you know, you do <laughs> have sure. those moments where yeah. you've got to find that's that space to breathe. It's so. good to know that you need that too, which I think is like half the problem with a lot of artists that I work with, which is just chilling is not part of their schedule and so it doesn't ever happen and then it's like to get in a session with someone who's burnt out and try and kind of get them excited about anything is is challenging but it's like the whole hustle and everything is cultural and music and and in general now like you want to prove that you're up all night in the studio and you're doing a million things and that's like looks cool but it's also not conducive to being creative it's not and I also tell my artists all the time that are touring you have to get your sleep you know mm -hmm. I was with one of my 
bands late last night. They are in Australia for their award show. And I said to the guys, we were Skyping and warming up. And I said, listen, sleep is your highest currency. Yeah. They all looked very rested. They'd had some time off and their voices sounded a little bit better. I said, sleep is your high cur- highest currency. Just because you're 21 years old or 22 years old doesn't mean that you don't need sleep. Right. You're doing things in your lifestyle that are very different than going to a nine to five job. Right. And you have to make provisions for that. Yeah. hundred percent. For sure. Um, I also want to know, I'm curious about Sweden. It's become such a popular place for pop music, right? Mm-hmm. We all know that. Um, have you experienced that? What, what, and is, is, is that something that you've started from or got any inspiration from or have worked with? Swedish people? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'm, so I, I'm signed to Dr. Luke's company and mm-hmm. he kind of, his, he and Max Martin started together. And so their whole basis that I learned when I first came out here was kind of the math of songwriting and mm. melodic math, which is like, for example, like the verse should be the lowest, the pre should be a little bit higher note, note wise. And then the chorus is the highest, um, or things like if the verse is starting on the one rhythmically, then you want to start the pre after the one or before the one and just variation and stuff like that and repetition. Um, so that was like my boot camp when I first started, which was hard. It was really challenging for me com- coming from someone who would just sit down at the piano and like write my emotions. Well, to there's now. a formula. Yeah, right? exactly. There's a formula to songwriting. So did did so did did Luke and Max? They took you under your wi- your their wing, or Luke did they did, have yeah. Luke did? Mm-hmm. So how did that come about? Um, so it's a crazy story. But basically, when I was in my band, um, this woman named Ria Pasricha found. Uh, found us on MySpace. <laughs> okay, and I remember to, MySpace. Yeah, <laughs> it was a, it was really a thing. That's how I got it discovered. It was a big thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she came to one of our shows, and she was an intern at Atlantic at the time. Um, and she emailed me after and was like, "That's really great, but it needs work. But like, let's stay in touch." And then we kind of. I just didn't speak to her for a while because our band was kind of falling apart, whatever. And then when I started writing it with other people, um, I sent her a bunch of songs and I was like, can I come in and play some more stuff for you? She said, I'm actually, I just moved to LA and tomorrow I'm starting work at Prescription Songs, Dr. Luke's publishing company. This is just all like so serendipitous. Yeah. Um, and then she kept in touch a lot and kept saying I'm gonna play your stuff for Luke which at the time I was like okay did like, you know who he was I, mean, how I long actually ago are we talking about here no I had to I had to google him. oh you did <laughs> and then I was like oh he's done every single yeah. song that I've ever heard of that's playing on the radio right now um so I didn't really believe she was gonna play my stuff for him it seemed ridiculous to me but one night she texted me and was like look at your Facebook messages and I opened my Facebook and it was a message from Luke being like, we love your stuff and I'd love to have you come out and meet oh. us. And and then a few months later, I signed with them. And it was back when Prescription was like, it was just starting as a publishing company. Um, they were hiring A&Rs and kind of expanding it. So it was, it felt crazy to me that I was being signed to this company that had no one on it. And I was just, it was amazing. They took a shot on me when I had nothing going on I didn't realize they were uh I didn't realize the connection with uh Luke and Sweden I guess yeah. I should have known I've I've worked with many many people that work with Luke I've only mm-hmm. had one conversation with him which was actually pretty recently over another client that we're working with yeah um, uh her career and all of that but um you, it's fun to listen to the parallels and how people got started yeah for sure um so it, you know there are cities all over the world where you see this kind of change and music is evolve, uh, evolving constantly. Um, so in your view, I don't know, this is, this seems like kind of a basic question, but everybody answers it a little bit differently. What, mm-hmm. what, what does it take to be a modern songwriter today? I mean, is there, you were just talking about formula yeah. and everybody has a different formula, right? And, and I know being in this business a very long time that you get to different places from different paths and you just never know what's going to explode. Like your experience with Luke and and Max and all of that, you never know who's going to pass your, your stuff on, you know? So those are those groundbreaking moments, but what today, I don't know what a songwriter need to know or a person that wants to be a songwriter need to know about being in this, this culture. Yeah. And it's a good question because I think even with the math or theory or anything, those things are kind of good to know and then kind of put away. 
And to me, what, what I, what always draws me in. And when I think of my own stuff, that's been the most successful. It's like when it's not chasing something, when it's not trying to emulate what's on the radio now or what people are looking for. Um, and it's kind of just not confined to any of that. Right. I mean, of course you need like some sensibility and things need to be catchy and, and that kind of stuff. But I think what, what works the best is when something is really different, when someone has their own unique voice. And I think I'm, I'm actually looking to try and sign somebody now. And it's, it's so funny listening to so much stuff. Cause it's like, I'm all I'm looking for. And all that's drawn me in is when it's like, okay, I've never heard anything like this. This is crazy. Like it doesn't sound like what's on the radio now. And that's what's interesting about that's it. That's the hardest thing to talk to artists about. I know for me, I just had this conversation with one of my artists and the managers are trying to push him in a direction. Uh, and I said, but you know, everybody has an agenda and it doesn't mean that that's a bad thing. It just means that most people are going to have an agenda. Right. And so, you know, your manager has an agenda, but if it doesn't feel good to right. you, it's the wrong direction. Right. Stay true to yourself, stay too true to your music. And if you make it wonderful, if you don't, at least you did it, you know, Frank Sinatra said, I did it my way. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and isn't it, don't you find that hard to to pound into young people's heads? I mean, you are still very young in, in, in my estimation, but we have writers that are coming up that are teenagers now, right. much younger, and you're sort of like this mentor to them. So it's hard pounding that into them to get them to understand. It just has to be unique. Right. No, and, and I think this is like, that's the most complicated thing probably about other industries as well. But just in my experience in music is when you're first starting out and some big shot is like giving you a chance or something, but they're saying you need to do this or you need to write this way, or you should give this song that you don't want to give away to this person. And it's like to, to see that and see, okay, I have this quick, like instant gratification thing I can do because this person wants me to, or I know that this is not, this doesn't feel right. And it's, it's just nuts because it's so hard to remember that in those situations. But in my experience, at least it's been like the most, the, the thing I'm most grateful that I, like I said earlier, there's no songs I've given away that I wish I didn't give away. And that's just like, this that. feels really good. Cause it, it that would suck. <laughs> it would suck, you know, and I love that we're both like-minded in that, that, you know, through the decades or the generations of being in the business and in, in, in the same way, in different ways, being in the music industry is really tough. And, you know, for my young artists, that's my biggest thing is follow your intuition. Some people don't even know what that is though. They right. don't know what it is. And so they let the managers or they let the labels come in and tell them how to run their business because they want that shot so badly right. but they're I said they're throwing you to the wall to see if you stick exactly and they're it, this is the thing that that's always frustrating about that is like no one at the label or manager is being malicious it's usually just like this worked on this artist so now we're gonna try it on you it's a formula right but then it's like the whole reason they signed you in the first place is because you are offering something different and I think I think when you do push back as an artist or, or a writer or whatever, when you're kind of like, nah, I don't want to do that. I want to do my thing. You gain respect from the people you're working 100%. with. hundred percent. And I, I think sometimes the artists, they lose their way. And I've also told, told my artists that sometimes the labels and the managers lose their way. They don't know what they're doing right. either. Right. They could have been at a label for a decade and they still kind of are making it up as they go. Right. So trust your own instincts. That's really important. Um, and I think that's a lesson for all of us. That's just human life, yeah. right? Yeah, trust for sure your instincts and understand what intuition is. So I love that answer. Um, moving on to New York, you, you mentioned earlier how you're from New York. Um, yeah. and I'm wondering how that city had a creative impact on your journey. If, if any. Yeah. Huge, huge. I always say growing up in New York is the best thing that ever happened to me because I, my parents especially are really good about making sure we took everything in. Um, they took us to the opera when we were like four oh, years old. That. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, my twin brother actually sang in the children's chorus at the Met for years until his voice dropped, but he was oh, <laughs> he was amazing. fully in the choir there. Yeah, and so I used to go see him all the time. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's and, amazing. And I remember my mom always talks about this now that we would walk in as, as like toddlers into the opera and everyone in, in the Met would be looking at us like, how are these parents bringing these little kids? Like they're going to ruin the show for us. And we just sit there quietly and watch you. They were, you were underestimated. Yeah. Right? That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So there's that there's Broadway. And then kind of when I became old enough to go venture out by myself, there was just so many shows to see and open mics and just everything's there. And so 
I, I mean, and my band kind of starting there was always cool to, okay, we can play this one tiny venue and sell it out to like 40 people or whatever it is. And then they'll let us play at this slightly bigger venue and just kind of working our way up there was awesome. It's just a great place to start, I think. Well, there's a lot at your fingertips yeah. too at New York. You know, there's a lot. It's different than growing up in a smaller, more rural place. You know, you know, you New York right. is such a big city that you get your education very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and sure. you learn very quickly because there is so much art there to do. There's so many, um, there's so many things to see that you're able to, I think just be a little bit more sophisticated maybe yeah. as an artist, as a writer. So it doesn't, that doesn't shock me why you're more sophisticated, I think as a person. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, I think it's you 26. Yeah. Yeah. 26, you know, I mean, I don't know to me it, that's, it's still young, <laughs> but, but it's, it's, it's relative, right? I've, you've got such a long way to go and it's so cool to hear where people are from and, and, yeah. and how they're inspired. Um, and I, you know, I want to move on a little bit to business with you because mm -hmm. to building a successful team, what do you think it takes in the industry to do that today? I know everybody's trying to do it their own way, but you do have to have a team around you. You know, you start out as one, but then you've got to be very careful and selective about the people that you surround yourself by. So yeah. what, what would you say is, is a challenge in, in, in that in the industry and how do you build successful team? Yeah, I think it's really hard. I think I've been like insanely lucky with the people that I work with just because I found them kind of just early on in this phase of my career at least. And, and they're good people first and foremost, which is kind of, that's, that's it. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to, it's, it's, it's hard to find in life, but particularly in this yeah. industry, it's very difficult to find people that are, um, are true. So. Right. Mm -hmm. And that care about you as a person more than anything else. I think there's been a lot of decisions, just like life decisions that align with career decisions or not that I've had to make. And, and knowing that my manager and my publisher care about me being okay as a person when we're making these decisions is something I'm, I'm like very lucky and grateful for. And I think a manager is probably well, I was going to say it's the hardest to find. Like, I think every person on your team is hard to find just because, like you said, like it's hard to find good people in general and yeah. especially people that you want to entrust with everything. Um, That's hard. Yeah, it's, it's really hard. hard. It's hard to delegate and let go. Right. You know, so I know I had a hard time with that. With my small business as it grew, letting go is really hard and yeah. trusting somebody to do that when you've worked so hard to get exactly. where you are. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and tough. I think I always say with, with my manager and like what, what someone should be looking for in a manager, I guess, is I know that when he goes into a meeting, he's saying what I would say if I was sitting there, mm -hmm. which is like, I just have a bunch of friends who get in fights with their managers because they find out later that they were misrepresenting them or saying something that they wouldn't agree with. And it's kind of like, that's so scary. You, you're hiring <laughs> someone me. so that you have time to go be creative and not worry about all that stuff. So if they're saying, if they're misrepresenting you, it's like, that's they, not they, a help. That's... Somebody that has your highest yeah. good. Yeah. At the end of the day, um, you know, and, and bouncing off of that, obviously you've made a, a big name for yourself so far as a songwriter, um, and writing music for other artists as we've talked about, how do you fuse the business side, the, like the publishing and the creative side? How do you fuse those two together? It's funny, I used to, I've kind of tried to take a little bit more of a backseat just because the business, I love it and it fascinates me and I think there's a lot of room for improvement for representation of songwriters. Mm -hmm. um, this is like a whole other conversation, but basically songwriters, songwriters who in my opinion are, are maybe the highest on the totem pole just in, in, on the creation of music side only because like without the song, there's no tour, there's no merch, there's no, there's nothing. Um, and they're not treated that way at all. They're not even treated as equals in terms of splits and, and how labels take songs for artists. They always pay the producer and the writer is like just taking a gamble. Um, so it's been cool and interesting kind of treading the line of, okay, with these artists that I have good relationships with now, I'm going to start asking for like, what the producer is getting and stuff like that. So that's been, it's cool. And there's a lot of people taking these initiatives now. I don't know if you know Ross Golan mm -hmm. and his, and the writer is like, he's done amazing work for this and he's constantly talking about it and spreading that information, which is great. But 
what's cool is that the songwriter community is becoming more and more of a thing. I think people are more and more interested in who's who's writing this song and then what other songs are they writing? I mean, really, like just in the last five yeah. years ish maybe even less yeah become, you see it everywhere yeah for sure and even like this year spotify adding credits to every song you can see on the song who wrote it and who produced it um and we always used to say it was so interesting like my page that was getting the most hits was wikipedia just because i think people are looking for that information um and so it's more of a conversation there's it's weird now if an artist is trying to bury the songwriters and it's more common that artists are like adding credits to the album artwork or talking about the people they made the song with. So it's cool. Like it's really cool what's happening. I know you, I've never seen that. I mean, I've seen an explosion of it, like I said recently, but you know, being in the music business for 25 years, it's, it's very interesting to me to watch that shift because usually the songwriters were totally buried, right? you know, and, and, and everybody just believed that so-and-so wrote the song and that, you know, they have a whole team behind them and right. half the time they didn't even write a word. They're right. just getting up there and, and singing and performing it. And they, I think that the fans buy into this whole right. package of who this person is, but you're now we're getting under, underneath it under right. the underbelly and going, Oh no, 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 no. There's a whole, there's a whole team of people or there's another person or two people that wrote this song where these lyrics came from. Right. And so you're seeing more and more songwriters do what you do. I mean, you actually have a very cool voice, but you're seeing, I'm seeing more songwriters come in and go, I need to learn how to sing. Yeah. If not to be an artist, but just to be able to sing the demos right. better and to feel like they can express what they're writing down on paper. Right. No, totally. So I, I find that really very interesting. Um, and speaking of that, uh, how important do you feel it is to sing for most songwriters? So I've, it's been really important to me and just important. I mean, even early on, I think I knew that however good or bad the song was, I could get in the booth and like make it interesting, um, with phrasing or whatever it is, um, which, which helped, which helped pitch songs early on. I think for better, for worse, a song, a demo with a, with an interesting vocal that, that has almost artistry in it already is easier to cut through. Um, so yeah, it's been super helpful and it's also really interesting then when an artist is going to cut it, having them make it their own while also keeping what everyone loved about the record in the first place. So that's been a really, that's always an interesting thing. It is fun to watch artists. I have a client who's a writer um, written a lot uh, she very interesting gal and she would come in and say I want to be better I'm so shy and I'm so I just write in my room with all my stuff where I'm safe you know yeah. I mean, she was just sort of your quintessential what you think a writer would be and she's like I want to get better at being a singer um, and I had so much respect for her she would always say gosh your, your voice is so crystal clear and perfect and I go that's one of the reasons why I I wasn't an artist because I could sing the, a demo, but right. you got to find, as you said, in songs and in artists, what makes them interesting. Right. And she would phrase in a way that just blew my mind. Like I would never have thought of that shit. Not yeah. in a million years. I'm like, <laughs> what did she just do that? Yeah. So people have their different places and, um, right. and, and their different, their different, um, um, experiences. So, um, your first vocal credit though was capsize. Yeah. And I didn't know that actually either like diving back into um you know earlier in your career mm -hmm. so a song um was released by friendship yeah right and that was your first band no this they're just people that i had written with oh they're so they're not so what was the what was your first band we we're called emily warren and the betters okay <laughs> So. <laughs> and then moving back to that for a second, because I know we, we glossed over it. I want to hear a little bit more about that. So how old were you when you started that band? Mm, I was in 10th grade. So. Okay. So, wow. Whatever that is, 15? Yeah, so about 15. And then was that just friends of yours that you knew that you just put a band together? and? Yeah, it's funny, actually. That's I, I had written an EP that my dad, my dad also has a, he's a lawyer, but he has a band of his friends he's always played with. And so they were doing the demos with me, his band. Um, and then I put this EP out just when I was in middle school. Um, and my older brother's friends had a band that had just split up like a reggae band. 
And one night they were walking out and I was like, hey, guys, is there any way you would you would play a show with me? And they all said no. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, Thanks. I'll pay you. <laughs> and they said, OK. And so I, I spent the next like six months babysitting every night to make enough money to pay them to do this show. Oh, that's cool. That's very it's a, that's really cool. Though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that's how you know you really want to do something. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and we played at this like tiny jazz club uh on Christopher Street in the village called 55 Bar. And because I was a 10th grader and all my friends came but weren't old enough really to go out of the house by themselves, they all brought their parents and the place was like rammed. There was a line around the block. That's and crazy. so the band were like, oh, like this is legit. This is a thing. This, I- this show is sold out. Oh, I love that. Um, and we just started playing together. And I think after about a year, we... It was like very official and we started make we started like playing all around the city and we did an EP together and we were rehearsing like every other day and, and playing multiple times a week and that was high school. Then you said, Now aren't you glad you said yes, even though I didn't <laughs> yeah. pay you for that show. Exactly. <laughs> um so so getting back to Capsize, that that song was a massive hit right was that now so being a layman trying to figure out everything about my clients was that your that was your first huge hit right yeah for sure um what what went into that and I don't know how did that feel that was crazy just because this the story of the song is really funny because I it was the day I graduated college and after my graduation I literally went in my robe to this session (laughs) and on the train my grandma left me a voicemail just saying she was proud of me or whatever. Yeah. And, and when I got to the session, I was like, my grandma just left me a voicemail. She's this amazing New York thick accent. Like, let me just put on the speakers and let's all listen. And we all got choked up. And that ended up being talking about her ended up being the inspiration for the song. And at the end of the song, there's a piece of the voicemail from her. <laughs> oh, I yeah. love that. Is yeah. she still alive? Yeah, she lo- she's loving the fame. <laughs> I love how I bet she does, right? She's like, oh, gosh, finally, some yeah. recognition for <laughs> yeah. my life. That's so cool. And that's, again, what we talked about before. That's where songs come from, exactly. right? Exactly. Those, those really important moments and staying true to yourself. And I, I think that every listener out there, every fan out there can take a page out of that book. For yeah. sure. Definitely. Because it's it's something that is so unique, and I think asking you the question if you to be the best artist you can be or the best writer, you have to have those stories. Oh, for they sure. They have to be important, and you have to want to write about them, and you have to be a deep enough soul to be able to dive into that material. Yeah. So it's also the most rewarding, I think, to write about real things versus just kind of like rhyming and whatever. When you have a really good session and you help someone say something or you get something out that you haven't been able to articulate, it's like such, it's so therapeutic. It takes a village sometimes. Yeah. yeah. It's nice. How do you build that songwriting muscle? I mean, I know That's you, kind of, you kind of touched on it, but I think just doing it, right? Repetition. But how, yeah. how did you feel like you built it? The people I mean, around you? Yeah. A lot of the people around me, I think, lots of trial and error I mean I did a year and a half of writing songs that were just you know titles I had on my phone and just trying to make up a story that that made that word make sense um and then I had kind of an aha moment where I realized I can get inspiration from (laughs) real life and I don't have to worry so much about inventing a story every time um and that's just that changed everything for me and I think there's that there's like you said repetition I've done so many I used to do so many sessions a week and no good songs came out of it pretty much, but just going in every day. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I can't, I, ah, that's writing to me. Yeah. I mean, when I was younger, I, that's one of the reasons I didn't become a writer. I mean, first of all, everything sounded so totally dated, (laughs) but I, I, I I struggled with that. I struggled with, um, the experiences of life. It wasn't until my father passed away. I was already 27 years old where I really felt those moments of yeah. like this is real life where you feel real empathy and real pain right. and um that's when I really grew up you know and so to have those experiences when you're younger um you don't have to have those hard experiences I think but you do have to pay attention yeah for and sure I feel like a that's lot of true. writers don't pay attention so it's so nice to chat with somebody that that's why writers are so important you know singers are great and their performers are great but the writers are building these stories and they're doing the hard work and they're tapping into themselves. And that's where you get that, that hit, right? Yeah, for sure. So you've written, so how many songs have you written? Like just like today, 
there's literally, I think there's like 900 something songs oh. in my box of just like the last four years. <laughs> what do you do with all that material? I mean, how do you parse through all of that as a Lots writer? of them are hard drive hits. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, this is l- like what you were just saying a second ago about building the muscle. I don't view all of them as songs that should be coming out. I think 99% of them are just writing the same song over again until you get the one that's the one that someone cuts and then you hope for the best. I know what I wanted to ask you speaking on that. Um, do you ever write a song that's maybe not finished and do you ever let it go even though you know it's not done or maybe sell it to somebody or it's more of a business transaction, but you don't really, you're like, well, how do you be, how are you attached to something like that? If everything that's coming out of you has to be, you know, has to have sort of that Midas touch. Yeah. Have you ever released music that you, it wasn't finished yet, or maybe you weren't sure you, maybe you wanted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, yeah. how do you do that? Cause that would, those are the questions I would have as a writer. Like, do I want to do this? Do yeah. I want to finish it? Yeah. I mean, it's tricky. I think I'm, I, I, because maybe of OCD and just me needing to be organized, I don't love leaving songs like half done. Just I wouldn't think so. Yeah. If you've spent like seven hours at that point, I'm like, let's just make Finish it a it. song. But <laughs> yeah. there's definitely stuff that's come out that, I mean, I think especially in kind of the, the post songwriting process when someone does a vocal and I don't think it's like selling the song the best or whatever. And, and you know, you don't have control over that situation and it comes out. Um, that's like, that's kind of more. That happens more frequently. So uh, speaking of songs, so Don't Let Me Down, as we both know, was such a huge hit. And that was written with Scott Harris, right? Yeah. Is that right? Um, what's the story behind the hit? Because I personally still don't know. <laughs> this, this is a really funny, ridiculous story. But um, Scott and I were at Coachella. Like he and I both went with a bunch of friends um, to Coachella kind of like two weeks before this session that we had with Drew. Mm-hmm. Um and so we had never worked with Drew before. I, I'd met them like once or twice and we're on the way to the session. We're like, all right, what, you know, what would you want to hear if you were at Coachella? And I personally, I got lost from everyone and had no service. And it was, that's like really scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's just kind of like a zombie. Um, and so we were saying, okay, let's write kind of what it would be comforting to hear if you lost your friends at Coachella. And that's literally the inspiration behind Don't Let Me Down. But it was just nuts because that next year we went to Coachella and we're standing side stage like watching them play Don't Let Me Down. It was this perfect like full circle That's moment. That's a full circle moment. For yeah. sure. That's <laughs> surreal. I mean, those are those are the real moments though. Yeah. It's like reliving reliving something that you created. Yeah. You know, and, and it came out of something very real. I wouldn't want to be lost at Coachella either. <laughs> Who like, would? Get me the... <laughs> F out of here. Um, do you believe, I know we spoke a little bit about writer's block earlier, but what, when, when you're writing with multiple people, do you ever have a moment in writer's block where you all get together and you just like, nothing's coming from it? Do you, do you call the session? I mean, what do you do when that happens? Yeah. I mean, I think this is part of why it's nice to not work with new people every day and kind of go back with people that you're close with. I mean, like Drew is an amazing example because we've written together so much that when we get stuck, it's not a big deal. Like we'll just go get lunch or like we'll go do something else. And it's not like a day wasted because there's not so much pressure on that day. Yeah, He's good like that. Yeah. No, it's great. (laughs) It's great. He knows how to just stop something (laughs) and go do something else. I I always tell Drew, I said, you're like a moving target. Yeah, fully. You know, he's, he's, I completely know in a lesson when he's bored, you know, we're (laughs) coming to the end or he's just, his mind is on 10 things he needs to go do. I'm like, I'm going to let you go. It's very clear. Yes. It's very, very clear. He just starts wandering off, but it's, it's interesting. Um, so how often are you writing for an artist with the actual artist in the room? That's my preference. Um, so I kind of try and do that as much as possible. Um, there's also so much value in writing with other writers and pitching it. But for me, it's like, like I was saying earlier, I'm, I'm compelled by music that's honest. And if the artist is in the room and I can be like, what's going on with you? And you have to go, if this works out, like you're going to go sing this song a million times all over the place. So like it should connect with you. It should be from a real emotion. Mm -hmm. Um, so most of the time I think I'm with an artist and then I think 
we actually try and set time aside for me to write just for pitch because there's plenty of artists that don't have time to write or so don't do write. You, do you craft the melodies um, specifically for different types of singers or do you just write a melody and, I mean, does it just comes up organically in the room? Is Generally there- organically, I think often when I've tried to target an artist, they the song's not right for them and then you've kind of like, pigeonholed yourself so so you don't really believe then um because I feel like we've already covered this you don't really believe in the music trends or the rhythmic rhythmic trends you're all about like what's coming up what's new what's fresh what has has nobody ever heard before yeah for sure I mean yep. I I try I mean I instinctively kind of listen to older music and 60s music and stuff like that just because whenever I listen to what's happening right now too much it, it like clouds it seeps in. Yeah. And yeah. you can't help but be inspired from what you're listening to. And I right. think repeating what's happening right now is like not the move. <laughs> right. And then speaking about we have all of these different elements now where we didn't before. I, mean, I was talking to somebody the other day where I was 28 before I even had a phone. So we're yeah. all dealing with technology and how music is being presented and bought and paid for. Um, Spotify um, and streaming algorithms. How does that affect how you write your music today or does it? Yeah, this is a really interesting thing because it's a, I mean, there was definitely like a surge when Spotify started popping off a couple of years ago, like with the, I forget what it's called, like the skip rates or something where if somebody skips the song before it reaches 11 seconds or something like that, it doesn't count as a stream. Oh. So that's why all these like vocal chops in the beginning of songs started happening at things that would really like keep people in for at least 11 seconds. Oh, I just, that's so fascinating <laughs> to me. I actually did not know that. Yeah, I know that crazy. there was things going on, but you know, yeah. Yeah. But again, like th- that's one of those things. It's like, if you're going into the room trying to write a song, thinking about keeping people interested for more than 11 seconds like the chances of you writing a great song with that mentality are are in my experience at least like getting slimmer I think that's really important for the listeners yeah (laughs) excuse me anything that anybody that's going into this business or in this business because I don't think that gets talked about enough yeah for sure again I feel like the whole part of this conversation with you today is staying true to yourself you know, and as a writer, as a person staying true to yourself, you don't want to get pulled into what the labels want, the managers want, and the agents want, and Spotify. You know, how can you be an artist and how can you be creative when you've got all of these Rules. things coming at yeah. you? So it's nice that you can go sit in Wyoming and <laughs> exactly. You know, so so uh, if to me that seems like that's for a writer or artist, that's a big challenge that they face today. Yeah, actually, my. I have to just say that my like classic example of this and of not following rules is um, the song New Rules that I wrote with Caroline Aylin and Ian Kirkpatrick. Like everything about that song was what I wasn't supposed to be doing, what we weren't supposed to be doing. Like, first of all, when I first started writing, I was told never, this is crazy, (laughs) but never to write a song where the guy wasn't going to get it. Like, don't block the guy off completely. There needs to be a sliver of hope for the guy in the song. Really? That's what I was taught. <laughs> Why? I, I have what's, no what, what idea. Is, what is that? It's crazy. But that's like where music was at. For, I, it's a crazy thing. But I, I always was like. Is that a man, woman? What is that? Like a, it's because they have to have a, like a. I don't know, like a... Because then it's like not... A nice, guys don't care about it or I don't oh, know. Oh, okay. So you for the, for the I getcha. All but, right, but so... this is like complete... This is like in the last year with the Me Too stuff and everything. Oh, like this has yeah. completely changed. But that's that's how... That was like a common thing in pop music a few years ago. That was one of the rules. How do you write with all those constrictions? <laughs> I mean, that's just nuts. Yeah. And like, so in that day, we were when we were sitting down to write the song, which was again, like Caroline was going through exactly this, kept going back to a toxic relationship. And we were like, let's write the song that makes you stop doing that. Every time you listen to it, you'd be like, never mind, I'm not going to get into this again. Um, and the guy's clearly not getting it in the yeah. song. But it was just because we were being honest and not worrying about but the rules. But you have to be honest, right? Exactly. I, I'm listening to you talk right now. It's so fascinating. I'm thinking, you know, you guys have to come in, sit in my studio for a couple of days or a week, and you'll get so much material you won't know what to do <laughs> <laughs> with all the stories and what people are going through. Yeah. You know, but just being real and just being true to yourself and not following the, the rules, I, I would imagine just blocking that out completely. Yeah, for sure. Because then there's the artist side, then there's the, the business side, building a label, a publishing company. What are what what are what would you say are the most important parts to bring on first like lawyers publishers a and r probably lawyer (laughs) is probably the first thing 
um, so you don't get screwed. Right. Um, and then it's funny, like I publishing just f- from a writer's perspective, publishing is al- always a really interesting one because lots of people sign, or label even like people sign because either they need the money or they're like, Oh, this person's giving me a chance. Like this has to be, this is the first person that's approached me. And so this is right. But there's so much value to waiting a second and a seeing if that person is still interested in six months, um, and building a relationship and being like, Oh, let, let's, you know, have the publisher say, I'll put you in a session or let's try these things without insisting that you sign to them before they're willing to show, what their actual investment in you is. Um, So I think waiting is, is the most important thing. I love that I'm listening to all of this and I'm, what's going through my head right now is just such a educated, poised 26 year old (laughs) going back to that. But, but it does, it does make a difference and you can see where your parents, not knowing your parents had a huge impact on you. For sure. Um, And I think that is half the battle is just having that foundation you know, I have that foundation in my family and I wish that more of my clients had yeah. that foundation. We're because lucky to have it. Very lucky, very, very lucky because you do, you have a sense about you that it's just so very put together. And I can say out of all the in- interviews that I've done and being interviewed myself throughout the years, um, I love learning and I'm learning so much from you. And oh, I always, not that you. it's surprising, but I love to hear about how other people figured out their own journeys and, and right. how they deal with business right. and how it's different in, you know, different areas of, of the music business is like songwriting, right. publishing. But, um, another question that I was really curious about a company tracking new streaming data, um, to make it accessible to them. How does a company stay organized with, with all of that? Cause that, to me, that's incredibly overwhelming. I'm not, my studio manager, Ella does all of that stuff for me. Yeah. She's like a techie genius. <laughs> I am lost, you know, <laughs> I am like very basic stuff. So I, I have to go back and, and start from the beginning and kind of see how all that works. There's a whole, there's a whole, um, model that is running yeah. constantly. Do you mean like with ASCAP and stuff like that? Yeah. Like the, just any streaming data that's accessible to you and, and staying organized. How do you have somebody that tracks all of it from like yeah. where your songs are and, yeah, that's actually, I mean, it's an interesting one because I think it seems my overwhelming manager, is what I'm saying, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's also not like, I mean, it depends obviously who you are and what your goals are. But for me, like seeing statistics and seeing how many plays something is getting is not that necessary only just because like with my own artist stuff, the goal is not to like attack radio and have it blow out of the water it's kind of just my creative expression so I I always try and like whereas I pay attention with the chain smokers how well a song is doing for my own stuff it's kind of like that's not the point with this so I'm not even gonna I don't even know how many plays anything has because it's like you don't want to see something and compare it to something else and get insecure about what you've done and stuff like that. Interesting. That's what, you know, Drew always says to me, I said, Oh, did you see the show? Did you watch? No, I don't watch. I don't want to <laughs> see it. I don't want to know how I did. Yeah. Just tell me how I did. Yeah. You know? So I think, I think that is very interesting. Or like actors that I work with that don't watch themselves. They're like, I can't stand seeing myself on yeah. screen. And I'm like, but you're an actor. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's that, that you, but it makes more sense that you don't, that takes you out of the creative process. Right. Um, a breakdown of the relationship between a songwriter and a performing rights organization like BMI or ASCAP. What, it, what is that relationship? It's actually, um, they can kind of be just backseat and just literally collecting royalties for you. But what a lot of people don't know and what's actually really helpful for people, especially starting out to know is that there's people at ASCAP and BMI, like actual people that can help you meet managers or meet lawyers or put you in sessions and, and, uh, BMI was super, super helpful to me at the beginning, just, just meeting me, meeting, you know, different people in the industry and putting me in rooms with more people. And, and there's no, like, you don't owe them anything for it. So it's great when you're starting out, they're just kind of like a non-biased, helpful asset. So we, we had touched a little bit on, but on uh, a little bit on the differences between BMI and ASCAP. It's always been very confusing to me in all these years. Um, do you, you mentioned something in the break that you knew one thing about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, most, most people are very confused by it. What, what is your, what is your one thing that you, you do know about? The so two of those? they, they collect royalties. So they're, 
I mean, when you go into a bar, there'll be like a sticker on the bar saying that ASCAP or BMI or whatever collecting royalties. So if someone plays your song in a bar there, I don't, I don't really know. This is the thing that I don't fully understand. But the one piece I do know is if you look at a sound wave, like on, like on SoundCloud, how it used to be the whole song was a sound wave. They cut off like the very top sliver of that. And that's the song's fingerprint. And that is somehow how they track the song on an airplane or in a bar or in a restaurant whatever that's like their job is to and i don't know how <laughs> like do they have devices everywhere i don't fully get it but they collect and that's their main kind of role um and then between ascap and bmi i mean it's more it's kind of preference and then i think once once you have certain cuts you can use the two to leverage advances and stuff from one or the other and your your contract lasts I should know this like a year a year and a half and then it automatically renews unless you say you know i want to take some money to sign with you again or i'm going to take money from the other one and sign with them and that's like that's it pretty much it's very convoluted yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> well thank you i hope that cleared it up for everybody I mean, even needs slightly Wait, exactly. i should know more <laughs> um where where can our audience find you um on the internet yeah <laughs> on the internet and <laughs> I'm, I mean, yeah, Instagram, Spotify, all the places, um, but yeah. All the places that one goes. Yeah. What's coming up next for you? I know that you've been playing clubs and doing these, you know, sort of one-off cool shows. Yeah. Are you going to tour? What What's happening with that? This is actually, I just met with uh, my agent and my manager yesterday to kind of discuss this because my position on it is interesting and a little bit undecided just in the sense that I don't really want to stop writing with other people. Um, and to a certain extent to like fully do the artist thing, it has to be, it has to take up 99% of your time at least. <laughs> um, so we're talking about doing kind of more one-off things or if the right opportunity comes up, but kind of not like pivoting and just focusing only on that and trying to make that happen. Cause I think for me, the artist thing is, like I said, just, just a creative outlet, just me kind of making the songs that I can't make when I'm trying to do pop music and kind of just doing more interesting things and things that are just my own story and if people like it that's amazing but it's not I mean the songwriting is kind of my bread and butter so it gets to just be fun I love that you have a really healthy outlook and perspective on that because a lot of my other artists don't and they try to write and get in the studio and do everything on the off days during tour and they're just yeah. absolutely run ragged yeah and they're getting sick and they're not having fun and they're full of anxiety they're just trying to pack too many <laughs> things and i wouldn't want to do that i mean i saw what touring looked like even years ago before people had to tour their butts off because yeah. we didn't have the technology taking all the songs and the pirating i, I remember when napster came about um, I had this premonition of what that was going to look like and, and, it, and it happened where people are touring all year long just to make money. That's where their income is coming. And so to me, touring, it took the fun out of it. It was yeah. sort of a, a have to. And it's nice to have a very healthy perspective on that. It's almost like you've cornered the market. You get to do everything you want to <laughs> yeah. do and you don't have to be out on the road <laughs> exactly. all those days and be, God, look, here we go again. Here we go again. Here we go again. You're traveling. It's really difficult on the yeah. body. And how do you be creative in that space? It's impossible. So I love right. that you've carved out your, I think you're on the right <laughs> oh, path there. You. You've carved out this life for yourself. You know what it looks like. You know what you want. Um, and I think you're a really, truly an inspiration to people of your generation of, of how to get it right. Oh, so thank you so much. I, I wanted to talk to you, Emily, a little bit about um, just voice coaching and being a singer. I know that we didn't really touch on that at all um, and doing warm ups and how important it's become for you. I mean, you and I have been together a short time mm -hmm. um, as a student and teacher. Um, and I'm wondering how the warmups have affected you and what you've learned and, and, and how you've brought that into what you do on a daily basis now. Uh, it's changed everything for me genuinely. I mean, obviously on the artist side, but like we were saying earlier, I mean, with me, because I was kind of constrained before and it's opening up more now, I can only sing demos that then need to be pitched up later because I have a much lower voice just naturally than than most other female singers um so being able to sing things higher and not have to change the key down or change the key after the song's been produced out to fit somebody else is awesome and and i think so it goes a long way as a writer but then 
also obviously as an artist, I had no, I had no skills. I was just singing like how whatever came out of me, which is, which was good for a while, but also just very tiring and exhausting yeah. on the voice and, and limiting. it does it works for a while until it doesn't right and I think that's a conversation that you and I had had you know a lot of singers come in you need to understand how to use your instrument what your instrument is made of you have to understand what the anatomy is and if you don't know those questions you are again just throwing it to the wall to see if it sticks right. and so I think what I've noticed, if I can interject there, just listening to you sing, is just somebody that, again, was sort of flying by the seat of her pants and had this cool tone and this cool vibe. And then all of a sudden watching you understand the the warm-ups and the scales and the training, what really goes into being an athlete and being right. bionic as a singer is a really cool thing to watch. And, and having the feedback from you and um, from my artists and saying, I'm noticing the difference, I'm noticing the changes, and I'm not getting tired, or I'm noticing that my songs are easier, and I'm noticing that somebody's walking up to to me after and saying you know you sound just like the record those things and right. I'm hearing that in your vocal right. um, Thank you. so the warm-ups I think they're you know we've done as we do the lip rolls why the show is called lip roll um, which are are really important but w out of all those what what's your favorite or do you have one that you use now that you would never have thought you would you have used before yeah I mean I didn't really do any before which is crazy but so they're all great, but I think one of the things with you that that's really helped me is, you know, among the other, like very few other voice lessons I've ever done is it's all like exercises and no explanation. And you're, you're always saying like, oh, here's what's literally happening with your muscles and in your body, which just makes it so much easier to learn and to understand and appreciate why, okay, why are we doing all these scales instead of just like running through a million scales and sending me off? And I think that's why I've never connected in vocal lessons before. Cause I'm just l like learning anything in life. If it's not explained or if you don't understand why you're learning it, it's like, I'm not interested. <laughs> yeah, no. And I think that's a very human place to be. I think a lot of, uh, you know, not to be disparaging against, um, or toward other teachers or another teacher. There are some fabulous teachers out there, but I have found that most of them don't do a very good job or a job of explaining it at all. And I think right. part of the problem is, is that they don't know how to explain it. They're regurgitating things that they have learned on the collegiate level mm -hmm. or they've learned as a singer. And they've really sometimes haven't expanded their repertoire, if you will, on what goes on with the anatomy right. and the body. And that's why you'll see me work so um, directly with doctors and ear, nose and throat surgeons to surround myself with people that know more than me throughout right. my career. And I think it's so nice to have people plug in and, and understand why they're doing what they're doing. Because if you right. don't understand it, how can you go out and do it on your own? You know, I don't really want a singer to be beholden on me. I want to teach you. I'm, I'm a teacher. That's why it's called a vocal voice teacher yeah um so it's not just coaching you through a song but getting you to understand your anatomy so I love that you're using it yeah. and I love that you said it's crazy that I didn't do it before because that's <laughs> typically the response I'll get is yeah. um I can't I can't get on stage without it now I, I know that totally. I shouldn't do that right so I can't wait to see where the future leads with you as a as a vocalist taking all of that talent and that tone and adding the technique to it you know right. just continually making you bionic oh yeah <laughs> i really thank you for coming today emily and sharing your knowledge with us and um it's been i've learned a lot oh thank you for having me